troubled giant of the painter, Vincent van Gogh. The bare outlines of his life, an appreciated Dutch genius who in a fit of madness cut off his ear and later killed himself. Now there's a new biography that challenges a crucial part of the Van Gogh legend, a 10-year forensic investigation by two Pulitzer Prize-winning authors. If their detective work is right, it may well upend art history. Their story rambles from Van Gogh's birthplace in Holland to Paris, rural France, and to South Carolina. Much of our report is magnificently illustrated by the artist himself. Here, outside the village of Auvers in the French countryside he loved, on the very edge of the wheat fields he painted so vividly, here lies Vincent van Gogh, alongside his devoted brother, Theo. No soaring memorials, just two simple headstones. It couldn't be more moving knowing that Vincent spent most of his adult life wanting to be with Theo and to have them spend eternity lying next to each other is seriously touching. As we talked to co-author Stephen Nafee, a steady stream of pilgrims made their way through the fields to pay their respects at Vincent's grave. Tens of thousands of them come every year. Japanese visitors actually bring the ashes of their ancestors to pour on the grave of the painter of Starry Night. Russian visitors bring vodka to pour on the grave. The South Koreans brought music. Don McLean's famous anthem to Vincent, an artist largely ignored in his lifetime, even ridiculed by the art establishment, whose paintings are now valued in the hundreds of millions of dollars and command center stage at the great museums of the world. The colors are beautiful and they're bright and they're cheerful. And if it's a bowl of flowers, it's an exuberant bowl of irises or, or roses. If it's a landscape, it's all the beauty of the natural world washing over you. You don't have to have a degree in art history to understand that message. At the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, we talked of art and madness. Sitting by one of Van Gogh's iconic self-portraits, painted in 1889 at St. Paul, a clinic for the insane in Saint Remy. He had committed himself there for a year. Some other masterworks done at Saint Remy, irises, cypresses, and starry night. Whether it's starry night with all that swirling sky or the swirling brushstrokes in this painting, there are people who have said that this was a, a depiction of the craziness emanating from his mind. I don't think it, he's trying that at all. These beautiful, exquisitely colored blue brushstrokes are really creating a pattern of unity and harmony and beauty. And did several Within the madness, there was genius. Vincent was enormously proud that he painted this entire painting in less than an hour, about 45 minutes. He worked so quickly that in nine years he turned out more than a thousand paintings and another thousand drawings. These are, are not just crazy works of art by a crazy painter. These are intentional masterpieces by somebody who knows exactly what they're doing. For ten years, Steve Nathy and his partner, Greg Smith, who's recovering from cancer surgery, peered into every dark corner of Vincent van Gogh's life. He was laughed out of art school, couldn't hold a job, and even tried being a minister like his father with disastrous results. He was a, a wanderer, a kind of constant pilgrim, and a failure at virtually everything he did. Failed as a preacher, failed as a son. He couldn't find a niche anywhere. Even when he was working for an evangelical church, they found his behavior too weird, and so they just kicked him out. From childhood, he was haunted by inner demons, argumentative, given to strange outbursts, a social misfit. He eventually is a man who, who lived to be 37 years old and never really had a friend. He was a loner who needed company. Desperately. That's exactly right. Which is why he relished painting portraits. Though many were afraid of him and refused to pose, others agreed. A shepherd in Provence. Eugène Bach, a poet, 
Joseph Roulin, a mailman, a fellow patient at the insane asylum, Monsieur Trabouc, the head attendant there. Of all of his subjects, portraits were definitely his favorites. The reason was really less artistic than it was emotional, and that was out of his loneliness, one of his few ways to connect with people was to paint, paint somebody. So there's 150,000 of these cards. From their offices in Aiken, South Carolina, Smith and Nafee used a small army of researchers, translators, and computer experts to collect every known fact about the artist. They discovered a remarkable mind, an insatiable reader, Shakespeare, Zola, Dickens, Walt Whitman. This was a letter to his sister, Will, they wrote in 1888. An incurable letter writer who, for all his madness, was fluent in Dutch, French, German, and English. In addition to Vincent's letters, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam gave the authors access to a trove of family correspondence never before published. Anguished letters about Vincent, the stranger in their midst. Some people will be surprised at just how alienated he was from his family. And even Theo kept a certain distance from him. It fell on Theo Van Gogh, who looked remarkably like his older brother, to support Vincent financially, to be the peacemaker when the grown child at odds with a hostile world kept turning up on the family doorstep. Vincent first took up painting at Theo's suggestion, but concentrated on bleak, chilly scenes. Winter at the family parsonage, haggard peasants in abject poverty. Vincent used to literally bring the paintings into the family dining room, set them in a the chair so that the peasants could attend the family dinner. And that was enormously offensive to the, you know, the family thought he was crazy, literally. He was, in short, an embarrassment to his father, the austere Parson Van Gogh, the man of God Vincent had once tried to become. Throughout the rest of his life, he felt guilt or somehow responsibility for his father's death. How, how this, he just fought constantly with his father, and his father died of a stroke. The constant tension in the household, the family believed, contributed to the father's death, and the mother never forgave him. His mother had taught him to draw. Vincent painted her years after she had turned her back on him. I believe he has always been insane, she wrote. His suffering and ours has been the result. And yet he painted her with a forgiving smile, as if art might ease the pain. His whole approach to art was that the world is a angry and a hostile mean place. place, hostile place, and that art, like religion, was there to console those who were heartbroken by, by life. And, uh, and that was first and foremost him. He was first in line. What exactly was tormenting Vincent van Gogh? It was that single gruesome act that offers a clue, the ear incident. In 1888, Vincent found what he thought was a kindred spirit, fellow painter Paul Gauguin. For two months, they shared the famous yellow house in the southern French city of Arles. Why did Gauguin join it with him in the first place? Money. Very simply money. Theo was basically buying him as company for Vincent. Van Gogh painted Gauguin at work. Gauguin painted Van Gogh, but found Vincent's craziness impossible to live with. They argued bitterly, and Gauguin left. What followed was a major psychotic episode. Did he cut the entire ear off, or it was, lobe, it was, or it, uh, There is some dispute about that. It appears uh, that he cut off uh, uh, a more than the lobe, but less than the ent entire ear. It was a disturbing sight, even after it healed. In the hospital, Vincent was treated by a young intern named Felix Ray, who then spent months trying to diagnose his mental condition. Though doctors have debated the matter for a century, Nafi and Smith believe Dr. Ray's diagnosis was the right one. Temporal lobe epilepsy, which can induce a kind of horrible electric storm in the brain. Temporal lobe epilepsy was, was a brand new disease in uh, 1890. Or at least diagnosed. For the first time. Just, just been diagnosed. Since then, it's been 
better understood. They knew more about it. It's treatable now. And it's treatable. And we took what his doctors knew about it and laid that over what is now known about it. And so it, the fit was perfect. The seizures could be ignited by something as benign as sunlight streaming through the trees, by stress, by rejection, by strange dreams, his constant companions. He heard voices, saw ghosts accusing him of awful crimes. A person with the disease feels it coming on, and this, this terrible dread that comes with it. During the attack, you lose consciousness. You don't know what happens to you, and each new attack makes the next one more likely. So it is an absolutely terrifying disease. It was a madness foretold in many ways. There was epilepsy on both sides of Vincent's family, and he was marked from childhood with telltale symptoms. Angry, suspicious. A child who'd run away from home in a thunderstorm. The syndrome of behaviors that are exhibited by people with that disease uh, reads like a, a road map to Vincent's personality. The map of his madness, according to the accepted theory, ultimately led Vincent to the wheat fields one summer evening. There, armed with a pistol, he attempted suicide. Gravely wounded, he managed somehow to get himself down the hill and up the stairs to his tiny room. This room in the town of Auvers, where 30 hours later he died with Theo at his side. That's the story that's endured for 121 years. The first inkling I got that this, there was something wrong was when I really started to look at the existing story. There were so many things about it that were wrong and were, didn't make sense. Their database kept yielding inconsistencies, contradictions, and unexplained questions about the official story. For instance... How did he get the gun? Everybody in Auvers knew that he had been in a insane asylum. Pistols were a rarity in rural France. Who would have given Vincent van Gogh a gun? When we return, what the authors think is the true story of van Gogh's death.